The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the true Roman Catholic religion, as expounded by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of Vatican II and the so-called New Mass. Believe. I'm your host, Thomas Nagley, and with me tonight is Father William Jenkins from the Society of St. Pius V and pastor of Immaculate Conception Church in Norwood, Ohio. Hello, Father. How are you? Hello, Tom. Good to see you. Good to see you, you too. Father, as always, there's a, a plethora of current events that, that we could get into, but if we could, I think uh, we, it would be important to address a few emails here first that we've received. And this first one that I wanted to start off with was uh, concerning our last program where we talked about an email that we received concerning the Jewish people and uh, how our, our viewers said that they were the the evil of the world essentially and he replied he sent a reply in uh, essentially defending himself saying that Father Jenkins you mentioned my accusations of the Jews as the greatest evil in the world uh, involved a, he a feeling of hatred and I assure you that that is not true he then goes on to say how uh, various popes and papal bulls were, were made to condemn the Jews and gives a whole list of different movements that the Jewish people have been revolved, involved in, essentially defending himself from this position that he hates the Jews, just saying that the Jewish people are in fact evil and they are in fact behind the evil in the world. So how would you respond to that, Father? Well, I don't recall ever having said that this man hates the Jews, or is it a man or a woman, by the way, I don't know. Uh, actually, you never identified uh, whether it's even a male or female writer, but uh, I don't recall ever saying that this individual hates the Jews, you know, or is motivated by hatred. Uh, if I uh, went back and, and watched the program, I might find myself saying that, but I'd be very surprised. Uh, that's evidently what he interpreted me to mean, though, in any case. But I'm just saying that a lot of these. Uh, Accusations, it seems to me, are motivated by, you know, well, maybe not many, but um, there are those that are motivated by a certain hatred. And, and I see that as a blanket condemnation of every man, woman, and child, you know, who's said, descended from Abraham, <laughs> as though uh, they personally are motivated by a hatred <clears throat> for uh, Christ and the church and so on. Uh, in that case, uh, if that were true, I'm just saying I don't see any of that ever converting. But uh, in fact, we know from sacred scripture, in the Apocalypse, chapter 7, that tens of thousands of them will, in fact, be converted and will, um, you know, represent the, uh, the resistance of the Antichrist. <clears throat> so, uh, again, I'm, I'm just saying that I think it's uh, an overstatement. Um, to say that each and every single Jewish person, by that I mean someone um, who is uh, descended from the bloodline of Abraham, um, um, and, and, and embraces Judaism uh, as a religion. Uh, there aren't many who do that anymore. Uh, you know, most of it's a cultural uh, phenomenon. Uh, uh, or kind of a shared heritage phenomenon sort of thing um, has a personal hatred for our Lord. I don't know what that, that is what that gentleman is saying though. Uh, it, I interpreted his remarks to be uh, to mean that there are many Jews who are in fact avidly conspiring against Christ and his church and I agree with that. And uh, they are allied with uh, um, the natural naturalists and rationalists of philosophical stripes and and they are allied with uh, many other groups that are very immoral right <clears throat> that uh, have a common hatred for Christ our Lord said if they hate me they will hate you also he said that to his apostles and so I'm essentially agreeing with I, what I consider to be his fundamental point is that um, <clears throat> There is a, uh, a Jewish Kabbalistic conspiracy against Christ and the Church, as there was against our Lord himself uh, during his own lifetime, which precipitated his death. 
uh, sacrificial death on the cross. So um, my concern, though, again, is that the um, resistance to that be motivated by a love for God, a love for our Lord, a love for his church, rather than animosity toward those um, who are you know, the, involved in the conspiracy against him. Uh, that's all. I, I don't mean to accuse anyone in particular of having that hatred against um, the Jews or anyone else. I mean, just because somebody speaks about uh, uh, the Muslim, uh, uh, you, mean, you call it invasion, really? Uh, uh, and the intention to impose Sharia law on, on uh, us here in, in what's left of Christendom does not mean we're motivated by a hatred for Muslims. And uh, to point out that there are many Jews who are motivated, and avowedly so, uh, hatred for Christ, hatred for the Church, hatred for the traditional Catholic doctrine and moral teaching, is simply a matter of acknowledging what many of them have said. To uh, claim that Freemasons, also a uh, largely Jewish phenomenon, uh, right, the, the cabal uh, behind Masonry, and uh, manifested in masonry is uh, motivated by a certain hatred for our Lord, by his church, traditional, tra the traditional Catholicism, is simply to acknowledge that what they've said, we accept at face value that this is what their motivation is. Uh, when <clears throat> Nubius, the writer of the permanent instruction of the Alta Medina, the leader of the Italian Masons, writes in the early 1800s, that the goal of the Italian Freemasons is essentially that of Voltaire, to completely obliterate the very memory of Christ and Christianity, we take him at his word that that is what his intention is, that's all. And if that is what this gentleman is, uh, is saying here, then I, I agree with him to that extent. Yes, I do. I would just, uh, I, I'm just saying as a cautionary uh, remark that we have to make sure that our, motiva our motivation is a love for our Lord, and not simply a, um, well, to, to descend to the same level of those who hate Christ. We, we cannot respond by hating them. Sure. Father, he mentions here how various popes throughout history have condemned the, the Jewish people as a whole. This was actually sent, sent my way uh, sometime back where someone sent me a quote a, from a papal, a papal decree of Pope Eugenius IV. In fact, from the, uh, the Council of Florence in 1442, where he said that we decree and order that from now on and for all time, Christians shall not eat or drink with Jews, nor admit them to feast, nor cohabit with them, nor bathe with them. Christians shall not allow Jews to hold civil honors over Christians or to exercise public offices in the state. Mm -hmm. And and that, that was um, sent my way as kind of a... a uh, uh, an, an attack against Catholics, saying that Catholics do in fact hate Jews and Catholics are in fact anti-Semitic. So how no, would you respond? Well, to that? No, no. Okay. Th again, that's somebody's interpretation of those words, um, and that is attributed to what document? The council oh. from. I'm not sure. It doesn't say. It says it's from the Ecumenical Council of Florence. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm, you know, just wondering what, what exactly he's citing there. I've seen that. <laughs> But I'm wondering if he gave the citation for it. <clears throat> but, I mean, it was long understood back then that the Jews were actually conspiring against the faith, against the church. And as, insofar as they were looked upon as conspirators against, against Christendom, remember, I mean, even uh, during the time of, uh, in the 1400s with the Reconquista in uh, Spain, it was understood that the Jews were actually allies of the Muslims and uh, were impeding the Christian reconquest of Spain. And even after the success of the reconquest of Spain by the Christians, they were actively uh, in communication with the, with, the, uh, with the Muslims, conspiring to bring them back in, to re, uh, have a, a, an Islamic reconquista of Spain, which is why they were expelled, actually, from, uh, because they were looked upon as conspirators with the enemies of uh, Christian Spain. Okay, um, so of course, I mean there would be uh, measures taken to protect the uh, well civil civil society, Christian society, in Christendom against uh, against what was considered to be a uh, 
a malevolent force working for its destruction. Right? Uh, again, you know, that doesn't have to be motivated by hatred. It can be motivated by a simple matter of uh, self preservation, right? And a recognition that this is our enemy, our avowed enemy, and uh, we have to protect ourselves against those who are determined to destroy us. Um, <clears throat> you know, when our Lord stood in, in, uh, on trial before Pontius Pilate, and all of the accusations were made, being made against him by the leaders of the Jews, or the accusations of blasphemy and so on, um, and the Jews said, we have a law, and according to our law, he has to die, right? Because he made himself out to be the son of God. Uh, well, you know, Pontius Pilate, being a polytheist, thought of many gods, and probably you know, thought it possible that someone could be a son of God, quote-unquote, you know, according to his belief system. And uh, he was not willing to condemn our Lord on the basis of that. Certainly, he was, he was moved to condemn our Lord on the basis of an accusation that would be preferred against Pilate before Caesar, that he, Pilate, was no friend of Caesar. That got Pilate's attention. Well, politically motivated, as they like to say, but in any case, <clears throat> recall uh, that Pilate said, I find no cause in him, <clears throat> and... Um, our, the pilot washed his hands uh, of uh, any responsibility for our Lord. There was a symbolic measure of Pilate to say, I'm innocent of the blood of this man. And the leaders of the Jews said, His blood be upon us and upon our children. And the church took their words very seriously. They recorded in the Gospels that this was the invocation, the imprecation of uh, the Jewish leaders against the people that they would be guilty of the blood of Christ. <clears throat> and so the church has always understood this to be the case. This was the, this was the decision of the leaders of the Jewish people. Now, obviously, this was not going to be applicable to our Blessed Lady. It wasn't going to apply to the apostles. It wasn't going to apply to the many converts of the Jews who, um, who uh, came to Christ uh, to embrace the faith. Uh, on Pentecost Sunday, okay, so there were limitations. There were Jews who were not included in that, uh, in that kind of self self invoked curse. Yeah. But the Church has taken very seriously that uh, that statement, and um, you know one obviously um, sees that. I'm sad to say there are many Jews throughout history who have taken very seriously almost kind of a mission, like George Soros, for example, uh, the, the, uh, a very mission in life, for which he dedicates his time, his energies, and uh, his financial resources to do everything he can to destroy um, uh, any vestiges of Christianity that he can get his, his, his mitts on. <clears throat> um, interesting... You know, I suppose many of our, our listeners know who George Soros is, right? His father was an internationalist Jew, of course. And he believed that Esperanto was the wave of the future. Soros in Esperanto supposedly means I, I ascend or I will ascend. Kind of curious, you know, because that's what Satan said. I will ascend to the heights, you know and claim this throne, and make myself as the Most High. But also, um, and, and uh, George, I mean, even the name George has a sense of a worker of the earth. Someone who's a worker of the earth, and that he is, truly. Uh, sort of like Jorge, you know, a worker of the earth. And uh, then again, you have uh, Soros in Greek, you know, and it, the word appears in the in the New Testament once, mm -hmm. and it refers to a like a funerary urn filled with dead men's bones and ashes, full of dead men's bones and ashes. Our Lord even referred to the whited sepulchres, the Pharisees, that would paint them white to make them look pretty for festival days, but our Lord referred to them as kind of symbolic of the Pharisees themselves, who outwardly looked very respectable, but inwardly were full of, 
uh, corruption in dead men's bones. <clears throat> well, the name Soros in Biblical Greek has that connotation of a, a container, f f a casket full of dead, corrupting bones. You know? So uh, we have something there that is, uh, I don't know, take it for what it's worth, <clears throat> but there's something very evil going on there, no doubt about it. So, you know, I don't, bottom line, I don't accuse this gentleman or anyone else in particular of having, being motivated by hatred. I'm just urging us to be very careful not to be motivated by that and realize that, um, um, you know, that, that the Jewish people, uh, as, a, as, a, as a body, uh, may well be laboring under that curse drawn out upon them by their leaders, but by the grace of God, many of them have embraced our Lord and even died, given their lives for Him, notably the apostles themselves. Um, so, you know, it's, it's just not right to tar them all with the same brush, so to speak. And in the end, as I say, many of them will convert and they will be faithful to our Lord. By the way, as I mentioned in the last program, I mean, there are many who are claiming to be Jews, but they're not descendants of Abraham. They came to Judaism because it brought them a kind of uh, messianic idea of them uh, inheriting the, the uh, control of the world. Uh, this is what the Pharisees wanted. That's why they rejected our Lord. He didn't offer them that. But uh, there are other populations of very warlike people um, who in the course of, of the centuries have embraced Judaism because of that promise that they were meant to inherit uh, the control of, of the world. And they liked that idea and thought they could use Judaism as a, as a vehicle to obtain that goal. Sure. Well, Father, let's move on then uh, to another email we received from a new viewer who says that... Uh, he very recently found the truth and became a full-fledged traditionalist Catholic, and he would like to know if you go along with Father Anthony Chicada and his view of the Catholic Church. I have no idea. Okay. Whatever his view of the Catholic Church is, I, I would probably have to say no at this point, at least in some significant points, because Father Chicada is a proponent of the Took line of uh, clergy, which at one time he... Uh, absolutely rejected and even asked at the end of his monologue or of his, uh, uh, of his uh, essay two bishops in every garage is this the future of the Catholic Church absolutely not exclamation point so I would dare say that if you ask if I agree with Father Anthony Chicada's viewpoint or, or world view of the Catholic Church I'd say which one or at what at what point in his history <laughs> are we are we going to be looking and seeing what his thoughts were on the subject? Mm -hmm. Well, Father, he also has another question here um, where he gives a little bit of background and says that my present church is Latin Mass only, FSSP, using the pre-1962 Mass, which is the only one in the area. Yes, I know your view about compromising with the Novus Ordo Diocese, but they have been staunch advocates to the older Latin Mass and have a growing following with starter parishioners that are very well educated into the so-called Pope Francis and the rest of the Vatican II-induced troubles. Recently, our bishop did a Latin confirmation ceremony guided by two of our FSSP priests. Whether you count that as good or not, I don't know. I know they don't spit talking about Pope Francis, but they have told me in areas of going against Catholic tradition, just ignore his words and follow tradition, which is what I wanted to hear and what you said in the past. I know that those priests must follow a fine line since they are within a Catholic Novus Ordo diocese, but neither priest have led us away from the truth. Eventually the church will have to go underground or hidden as we are routed out as in the early days of the church if we believe in the operations of La Salette. Fatima and the other approved ones. But until then, we should not unite against, should we not unite against the real enemy rather than fight each other on issues of whether a Novus Ordo Mass has ever been said in the church or not. Please advise. Well, as far as arguing whether a Novus Ordo Mass has ever been, uh, I'm not sure where that's coming from because <laughs> um, I don't recall having ordered that, having made that an issue or the issue anyway. He asked a number of questions in there, actually, but, uh, you know, you, you have to look uh, at the question of the Novus Ordo sacraments and whether they're valid. 
He mentions a confirmation ceremony conducted by the Bishop of the Novus Ordo Diocese there. And uh, I, I guess we have to, this is a presumption that the Novus Ordo Bishop was himself ordained and consecrated in the Novus Ordo ceremony by s ceremonies who, by, by a bishop himself who had been perhaps ordained and consecrated in the Novus Ordo ceremonies. The new order ceremonies of consecration of bishops and ordination of priests and uh, I, I would say that the very least we can we can say there is that there's a doubtful a doubt of the validity, and that's not something negotiable. That's not something we can just overlook for the sake of expediency. I mean, it's, it's a very serious thing. It's what the, it goes right to the heart of the question, isn't it? It's a novus ordo. It's a new order, and so <clears throat> we can't brush aside serious questions uh, for the sake of um, <clears throat> going along to get along. Uh, there are the difficult questions that need to be faced, and uh, th these are among them. Um, the um, the validity of the Novus Ordo sacraments, you know, one can look at them as they are on the books, and we can look at them as they actually are performed <coughs> uh, in the Novus Ordo churches by the Novus Ordo clergy. And the fact that the bishop might uh, perform a Latin ceremony does not make him a traditional Catholic bishop, certainly, all right? Uh, it takes a lot more than that, clearly. So, um, but uh, the, the problem, well, a problem is with the fraternity of St. Peter is that they are uh, actually officially a part of a new order. And uh, they, they are considered to be the extraordinary form of worship. Uh, so even they are already marginalized within the Novus Ordo. But they claim to be formally a part of it. That's the problem. And insofar as that goes, they have to be saying it is essentially the same religion. They were practicing essentially the same religion. Um, if they didn't, if they if they didn't believe that was true, they could not, in good conscience, be members of the fraternity of Saint Peter and be going along with it and saying we're within the fold. We are we are members of that religion. We are formally united with it. And um, if they saw it as a as a false religion, that was is basically the religion or the practice of modernism. They'd have to say, we do not belong to this. And uh, we cannot say that, yes, we hold the traditional Catholic faith, but we also acknowledge that we belong to a, uh, a body, uh, a religious body, a church, which holds as its ordinary form of worship and belief a new faith and a new religion, a different religion. Well, if they, if they acknowledge formally by their membership there that the Novus Ordo is in fact still the Catholic religion, then they're just basically saying that this is our way of doing it, and the Novus Ordo is another way of doing it. They, that's the ordinary way of doing it, and we have the traditional way of doing it, but they actually amount to the same thing anyway, and uh, so we can belong to the same church. You can't have two different religions uh, within the same church. And the whole idea is ridiculous. You know? It's like saying God can found two different religions. He can have found different <coughs> one church with two different uh, faiths and two different religions. Impossible. So, uh, the, in, in other words, the approach that our fine uh, listener is, is uh, or watcher, viewer, is, approach is uh, advocating here is fraught with contradictions. And what it would come down to is, if it were a matter simply of compromising along the way, uh, we would essentially become ecumenic, ecumenists. We would be essentially conceding the fundamental pr principle of the modernists. <clears throat> that yes, you can have one, one church with two different religions, which are the practices of two different faiths, the one faith, Catholicism, and the other faith, Modernism. And we can't, we can't agree with that. In principle, we have to say this is wrong, because the very, the very idea of doing that is already to concede the fundamental point of Modernism, that all truth is relative, 
that all faiths are more or less correct, and that the practice of these different faiths can be embraced by one big, big umbrella church. Uh, we can't, we can't agree with that. Um, something else that uh, the the writer mentions here, as I recall, is. Uh, he says that I have advocated ignoring what Francis says and just to following the truth. And I, no, I never said that. I've never said that. I don't say ignore what Francis says. We have to acknowledge what he says and, and, and condemn it when it is a, a, a blasphemous, sacrilegious, heretical. We can't ignore it. That's not right. But that's exactly what they have to do in the SSP and the other groups that are under the big tent of the Novus Ordo and trying to practice the traditional religion, the traditional Catholic religion, within the Novus Ordo Big Tent. They acknowledge the ecumenism, and uh, if they acknowledge that they can be under the Big Tent of the Novus Ordo, the New Order, and practice the traditional Catholic faith, well, then why would they say that, that you, can ha you can't have Buddhists and Hindus doing the same thing? If you can have two different religions, why not three or four or five? All within the Novus Ordo <coughs> Church. Um, the, the price of silence that they're buying by gaining the, uh, the approval or acceptance or at least toleration, toleration of the Novus Ordo authorities is a price that we cannot in good conscience pay. Mm -hmm. And no, we cannot be silent any more than we can be silent when the people would cry out, crucify him, crucify him. We cannot be uh, shouting out, crucify him with them, but neither can we um, just simply uh, hold our peace and do what the apostles did, which they were later very much ashamed of, run off into the darkness. Or as Peter did, just deny him. Right? I never knew the man. We can't pretend that. So uh, now, you know, our, our writer might think that I'm accusing him of doing that. No, I don't think he's... He's obviously motivated by an, an intention and wants to be faithful. He wants to be faithful. He's just trying to figure out the way to do that. Well, if I thought the, uh, the Fraternity of St. Peter was the way to do it, then I'd be looking for membership of the Fraternity of St. Peter. But I'm not, and in good conscience I couldn't. And that's why. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, in the spirit of not ignoring Francis, uh, in, in our last few minutes here, could you address the recent happenings where it's come out that Francis kind of officially approved this interpretation of Amor Satisia, which says that, in fact, it is permissible to, in some circumstances, give Holy Communion to divorced and remarried <clears throat> couples. And this, this uh, letter that he has sent to a group of bishops approving that interpretation has been raised to the level of authentic magisterium, and it's now <clears throat> supposedly infallible and, uh, and binding on the conscience of all good, good Catholics. How do you respond to that, Father? Uh, well, uh, unfortunately, you're right, Tom, and our, uh, our support staff, headed by Jorge here, um, <clears throat> has provided us with a copy of the Epistula Apostolica from the Octa Apostolic Cities of, uh, of 2016. And this is an official statement responding to the... Uh, the uh, pastoral statement of these bishops of South America, mm -hmm. right? The Novus Ordo bishops of South America, in which they were pastorally advising the people uh, under them and the priests that they would give Holy Communion to uh, people living in open adultery, that this was their interpretation of uh, Francis's apostolic exhortation, Amoris Laetitia. And uh, here we have the official response of the Francis Novus Ordo pontificate uh, to that w inquiry of these bishops. Is this the authentic interpretation of Francis's apostolic exhortation? And uh, after all, who can give a more authentic interpretation than Francis himself, right? <clears throat> and so um, after laying out in the octa, of uh, the year two, 2016, what the, these bishops of South America wrote in advising their priests that this is the authentic interpretation, give only communion, or their version of communion, give the communion wafer 
to those living in open, uh, unrepentant adultery. Uh, this is the response that came from Francis's unholy see. Re scriptum ex audientia. Okay, he says, Simus pontifex decernit ut duo documenta quae precedunt edantur per publicationem in situ, situ electronico vaticano in an actis apostolici sedis vel magisterium authentico. <coughs> and what he says here is the supreme pontiff <coughs> discerns that or decides that the two document, documents which precede, these are the documents of these uh, Nova Sordo South American bishops, are to be edited, okay, and to be included for publication in the electronic site of the Vatican and in the Apostolic, uh, Acta Apostolice Sedis as authentic magisterium. This is what they're saying here, that this is the authentic magisterium of Francis now, that is endorsing their understanding. <coughs> Of, uh, of uh, his, his meaning in the Amoris Laetitia, okay? So all of this other talk about, well, you know, give us the answer to the duty, and what, what exactly do you mean here by this? He's answering them right here. And this is published, ex edibus edicanis, from the halls of the Vatican, on the, uh, the fifth day of the month of June, in the year... And the year given here is 2017. And it comes under the uh, signature, which is perfectly legitimate and authoritative because he has the right to publish these things in the name of Francis, Petrus uh, Cardinalis uh, Parolin, Parolin, the Secretary of State. Um, so he is publishing this in the name of Francis. Um, that this is authentic magisterium of Francis and his modernist uh, modernist hierarchy there. So um, uh, Francis is speaking here officially as the Pope of the New Order. There's really nowhere else to go with this. I mean, people can uh, uh, try to worm around any way they they, can, they they want, but the fact is they've got to face the fact that this is what this is official magisterial teaching of Francis now. Um, so how they want, what conclusions they want to draw from that, well, that's fine. Unfortunately, there are people who are, uh, I would say, spiritual contortionists or theological contortionists desperately trying to avoid the inevitable. And that is, this, this is not only not Catholicism, this is anti-Catholicism that is proceeding out of the mouth of Francis. Mm -hmm. um, so, anyway, take it for what it is. <laughs> well, I'm sure there's a lot more that could be said about that, Father, and uh, we'll see what, what kind of response mm -hmm. that gets and what follows after this. But. Well, Tom, I know we've received a number of further inquiries on the, on the Turk Bishop line, too, and, you know, I, I feel badly devoting so much time to it because I thought the issue was largely closed and people had largely made decisions on the basis of what they knew or thought they knew. But the fact that there are so many continued inquiries into it makes me think that uh, the issue really is not closed. And when people do hear there's more to it, then they realize, you know, I really cannot just accept this at face value. I have to examine this more closely. Mm -hmm. And so really, um, I, I am at the point where I just want to move on. I can't because there are people who still have good questions. Mm -hmm. And I do think we need, to, they, they deserve some good answers. And I'm not saying I have all the good answers and the best answers, but I'm saying what answers I do have, I, I will be glad to give them. And in the next program, perhaps we should again look at some of those other questions that have come in. Sure. Um, and, um, you know, in my usual uh, brief fashion, try to uh, try yeah. to deal with them. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> I thank you for your dedication here. I thank uh, Jorge for his for his uh, help, enlightening help as well. And uh, also, of course, our um, technical staff of one <laughs> gentleman <laughs> yeah. who gives greatly of himself and many hours of his life to produce these programs and put them on the air. So may God bless them all. I appreciate that. Definitely. Thank you, Father. Thank you for being here tonight. You're welcome.
Thank you. Thanks to all of our viewers as well for watching this episode of What Catholics Believe. <clears throat> Until next time, we ask that you all remember the words of Our Lady of Fatima to consecrate yourselves and your families to the Immaculate Heart of Mary and to pray and do penance. Thank you and God bless you.